Father, we ask that we not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Lord, we ask that with your help, we will engraft the word to our very souls, that it'll begin to produce your fruit in us, to us, and through us in Jesus' name. Father, we ask, and Sandy prayed it earlier this morning, we ask that all fog be dissipated in Jesus' name, that any veil of the enemy might be pulled down, that we might understand your word, and not only understand it, but do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Talking about preparing personally for God's apostolic government. It's taken me some time to lay out the truths upon which we can build a proper understanding of ascension gifts. And as I've worked on this, I, I've been surprised at how many people do not even understand the term ascension gifts. Many have heard of apostles and prophets and the like, but they have never connected these spiritual gifts to Jesus' ascension. Listen, if we do not connect to his ascension, in whom we are also ascended and risen and seated with him, then we will not have the power or the understanding to exercise the ascension gifts in our own lives. Too many Christians do not realize that they already have all the blessings stored up for them in heaven, and because they are risen and seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, all they have to do is take hold of the blessings and begin to enjoy them. Number one, if you're taking notes, every spiritual blessing in Christ is ours now in the heavenly realms. And there'll be a little bit of variation between what you see on the, the overhead on the PowerPoints and what I'm preaching because this morning God put the now in. Every spiritual blessing in Christ is ours now in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 1, 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. A year or two ago, I wrote the book, Building on a Firm Foundation After Deliverance, to help people understand the many and the major blessings listed in Ephesians chapter 1. These blessings are key to people walking in the authority and power necessary to reign in the apostolic kingdom of heaven. God told me back then, if we'll raise our hands in, in the form of a funnel and begin praising him for blessings that are already ours in the heavenly realms, that we would receive them because God honors faith. We need these blessings in order to fulfill his apostolic calling and mandate on every life, this church and the world. Number two in your notes, when we understand our position in Christ, we can properly operate in whatever position he assigns us in the church and in the world. The blessings mentioned in Ephesians 1, 3 have the power to connect us with God's design and destiny for every life as seen in Ephesians 2, 6 through 10. There's five of them, and five represent grace. So I include all five verses because they indicate that we are now risen, we are now seated with Christ, for God's now purpose, directly relational, both to our salvation and to our prophetic destiny. Look at it with me. And God has raised us up with Christ and seated us in the heavenly realms in Christ. Say now. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Say now expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And the verse following that I totally missed as my early days as a Christian, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Say now which God has prepared in advance for us to do, say now. 
I believe that we are in the coming ages mentioned here, don't you? God wants to use us to demonstrate His incomparable riches of grace. Can you envision the effectiveness and the authority of the body of Christ, empowered by every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, gained from the seed of authority, already established in the heavenly realms, now, in and with and for you and me? Jesus envisions that. And he calls us to step into his vision. That is why he established his apostolic ascension gifts so we might complete our individual and corporate destiny to minister the good news to the entire world. Remember, Jesus said, you'll make disciples of nations. Number three, a proper foundation is needed to secure life and ministry. Too many doctrines and ministries fail to go to the depth God wants them to go because they do not have the proper foundation. We need the foundation of the Word of God and we need the foundation of the God of the Word. It isn't enough to have a few pet scriptures or proof texts to make other people see things our way. We need the whole of Scripture, empowered by the God of the Word, to move forward. The Holy Spirit inspired and inspires the Word of God. We must pay attention. If you consider the devil, he took verses out of context when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus, on the other hand, knew both the Word of God and the God of the Word well enough to confront the devil and debunk the misuse of Scripture. The devil still likes to take Scripture out of context to create doctrines that I call the doctrines of demons, which lead people to believe things like universal reconciliation, that all people are saved regardless of whether they receive Christ or not, that spiritual gifts ceased when the last of the original 12 apostles died, or that women cannot operate in fivefold ministries. The devil causes people to take parts of scriptures out of context to prove things that the rest of the scripture disproves. Many Christians have become prey, easy prey to the devil, because they have not shown themselves approved unto God by correctly handling the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. I was guilty of that as a young preacher. I loved the practical things from the latter chapters of the book of the Bible, especially the Pauline epistles. I liked preaching on marriage, family, spiritual gifts, even apostolic government before I understood it. But I lack the spiritual discipline to study the formative chapters, which prepare the platform and the power and the proper foundation needed for godly marriages, for godly families, for using spiritual gifts and the like. I used to dive right into Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6 without building a proper foundation from chapters 1, 2, and 3. The earlier portions of, of Ephesians lay a foundation of our spiritual blessings are in Christ, our position in the heavenly realms through Christ, our oneness as a body of Christ, and an explanation of Paul's specific calling and prayers for the church. That's equally true of people and programs. Remember when Jesus said, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and the destruction was complete. I knew an unscrupulous contractor who built a large pole barn as cheaply as possible to make as much money as possible. And rather than pouring a concrete pad for each pole to sit on and letting it, it fully cure and then using the, the, the required amount of concrete around the post to secure them against the, the freezing and thawing of, of Michigan's winters, 
He poured very thin pads to make it look like there was pads to pass inspection. And he poured a very small amount of gravel around them. And no matter how big and beautiful that barn looked on the outside, it wasn't worth what it cost because its foundation was shaky. And how many people try to build lives, marriages, careers, and ministries without first building a solid foundation? And let me give you a few examples from the scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 13. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, capital D, will declare it, because it'll be revealed by fire and the fire will touch, test each man's work of what sort it is. Then Ephesians 2, 19 to 21. Now, therefore, you... Let me say it as the Greek does. Now, therefore, you all are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and men, members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation, listen to the words here of Paul, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place. And I underscore that. A dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And one more Ephesians, or excuse me, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instructions about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. This is what we are doing as we study the ascension gifts. We are moving beyond where we have been stuck into the fullness of Christ. Number four. And that last one, I wish I had my little sign again. Congregation response needed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Number four, in addition to the foundation of the first three chapters, Ephesians 4 begins with reinforcement of godly character and unity. And unfortunately, we can all think of powerful evangelists, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers who have fallen short of the glory of God. And because we're forgiving people, we tend to forget, forgive and forget. But I'll tell you, the world can tell you every evangelist that backslid. People wonder why such wonderfully anointed people end up having affairs or misusing ministry funds. Let me give you the answer. In every case, their anointing proved greater than their character. They didn't build on the right foundation. To that end, Paul begs us to walk worthy of the calling we have received. We cannot re rest on the relationship we used to have with the Lord. We must keep current in our devotions, our prayers, our worship, our fellowship, and the like. If we sow right thoughts, we will reap right actions. If we sow right actions, we will reap right attitudes. If we sow right attitudes, we will reap right character. And don't you think that the church, the government, business, family, and entertainment can all build foundations of godly character and that they should build them before building their, their platforms? And Paul makes a couple of appeals, actually four. Letter A, appeal to godly character walking worthy of our calling. Amplified Bible, Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. I therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, appeal to and beg you to walk or lead a life worthy of the divine calling to which you have been called with behavior that is a credit to the summons to God's service, living as becomes you with complete lowliness of mind, humility, and meekness, unselfishness, gentleness, mildness, with patience, bearing with one another, and making allowances because you love one another. 
People in ministry are called to lovingly guard their flocks. Husbands are to love their wives and nourish their children. Children are called to obey, obey their parents and so on. This is all part of walking worthy of the Lord. In fact, Paul told Timothy that no one should be in Christian leadership if they do not manage their own families well. And let me tell you, that doesn't mean that your children are perfect. But when they're imperfect, that you respond in a godly matter manner. Let her be appeal to godly unity. Reading again from the Amplified Classic Version, Ephesians 4, 3, and 6. Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and oneness of and produced by the Spirit in the binding power of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as there is also one hope that belongs to the calling you received, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, sovereign over all, pervading all and living in us all. This morning the Lord spoke to me something that's not in the sermon, but he pointed out to me that every cult, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, on and on, Jim Jones, every cult started into air when it ignored the idea that there's one body in Christ. Every one of them says, we're the only group. We're the only ones that have a handle on the message. I remember one, one minister in our town said, we all have, all you guys have a corner on the truth. But he said, but we, and he named his church, we have the truth. And he invited us, us all to join in a catechism. And I thought that kind of thinking is against the very unity that the Bible commands. God speaks to us through Paul and tells us to be eager, to strive earnestly, to guard and keep the harmony and oneness of the Spirit. Yeah, there's some essentials that we will never back down from. But we must not allow non-essentials to divide us. I really don't care if women wear dresses or pants to church as long as they wear one or the other, amen? I don't care what Bible people read. There's one body. There's one universal church of which our local church is a small part. Pam and I are, are very committed to our local church. But Jesus is head of the universal church. Pam and I have, and we think it's good for people to have, vital connections beyond the local church. We are major connected with Breakthrough Apostolic Ministries Network. We're vitally com connected with the International Society of Deliverance Ministers. We're connected with the International Church of the Four Square gospel. We're connected to the Michiana BAM group, which we lead. We're connected to our local ministers association. You see, faithfulness to God includes being faithful to those we are in relationship with. Let her see. I'll step back into the last one for a minute. Barbara Yoder says you can go to lunch with anybody. You just need to choose carefully who you go to war with. I'm going to lunch this week with the Sturgis Ministers Association. I'll hug everybody there. I'll talk to everybody there. I'll tell them how glad I am to see them. But there's only four of them that I call to meet with me once a month for prayer. Because I know they know how to war. Let us see. Appeal to individual grace for the measurement of gift and calling. Ephesians 4, 7. Yet grace, God's unmerited favor was given to each of us individually, not indiscriminately, but in different ways, in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and bonus, bonus gift. Now, although God's grace is God's unmerited favor as amplified above, true grace includes the God-given desire and power to do God's will, God's way, according to the calling he has on each individual. You see, it takes a different grace to be a wife, 
probably a much greater grace to be a wife than it takes to be a husband. It takes a different grace to travel around the world to preach the gospel than it takes to pastor a small local, local church. It's not a better grace, it's just a different grace according to God's current calling on a person's life. I believe that grace changes as one's calling progresses. Pam and I have a, a, a different grace now because our responsibility is different than when our entire focus was on the local church. Thankfully, God gives us a grace needed as our callings grow. But we need to respond to it. We need to walk in it. The New King James Version says it this way. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Number five. Such grace is prerequisite of gifting. Have you ever considered how grace is gift specific? Have you? Let me ask you again. Have you ever considered how grace is gift specific? Paul addresses this particular grace according to the measure of Christ's gifting as he prepares you and me for our personal specific ascension gifts addressed in Ephesians chapter 4, 8. Quoting from Psalm 68, 18, Paul says, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. I just learned this week that the IRS doesn't want anyone to hold the title pastor or minister unless he or she has been licensed by an ecclesiastical body. Interesting, don't you think? I've been to small churches where the majority of the members cling to titles of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. And it's true, as we'll see as we go deeper into Ephesians chapter 4, that fivefold apostolic offices exist to prepare every member of the church for works of ministry. The grace of any ministry must be evident before any title is given. We must be careful of receiving a prophetic word and trying to fulfill it on our own strength. Prophetic words often point to the future. So I think it's a mistake to buy business cards saying apostle or prophet so-and-so the first time we hear an encouraging word. Many prophetic words are a call to prepare for ministry. Number five, are you getting anything out of this? Amen. You're being quiet. Number five, actually number six, true ordination Recognize ministry call and effectiveness. There's a huge difference between people who want to be in ministry and those who are called, equipped, and experienced in ministry. I entered professional ministry in July or might have been June of 1973. Unfortunately, that was only 15 months after I became a born-again Christian. I was already doing ministry, running an evangelistic bus route for our church, starting and overseeing a children's ministry for the new children that we were bringing into the church. In fact, we had to start junior church because the children we were bringing in didn't know how to behave in regular church. I also volunteered for Youth for Christ. I wanted more. I had that call for more. But looking back, I know I was trying to win my Heavenly Father's approval. I was trying to work hard enough, doing enough that God might say, good job, son. And I did have a call on my life to future ministry, but I didn't recognize my impatience. I didn't know of my need to prepare. I even approached my pastor, Pastor Bonnie, loved a man. And I said, Pastor Bonnie, why don't you put me on paid staff so I can quit my job and give my full attention to reaching the loss and equipping the newly saved? And I had it all figured out. I, I knew I could reach enough people that their ties would pay my salary. Pastor Bonnie didn't buy it. He was older than me and wiser than me. 
And he said, a call to ministry is a call to prepare for ministry. For him, that meant going to college. And I didn't think it was possible for me to attend college while rearing my small family. And I was tempted to take things into my own hands. In fact, in some ways I did. I learned it is important to, number seven, do it the fast way. Go slow and faithfully prepare for advancement. Jesus said that those who are faithful in that which is least will be given more opportunities and greater responsibility. I did remain faithful to my duties at church and with Youth for Christ, and I caught the attention of the Youth for Christ director who offered me a full-time job if I would start college, if I would enter their internship program, and if I could raise enough funds for my salary. And I so wanted to be in full-time ministry, I quit my job, took a large cut in pay, and began working my way through college. Looking back, I truly question whether what I did was within God's perfect will, or if it was even wise. God did use me. He did help me to make it through college in four years. But the price my family paid was costly. Because I worked full-time, I went to college full-time, and I was a husband and a father part-time. I honestly didn't know back then what it was supposed to come first. I thought I was being spiritual by putting school and ministry before family. And I look back, and even though my pastors, my YFC director, were godly men, their understanding of ministry was primarily that of pastors and teachers. After the powerful launch of the initial church through signs and wonders, work through apostles and prophets, the church in, at large came to the point where it had a form of religion that denied the power of apostolic ministry, which Jesus ordained to equip every member for works of service. I, like many others who have not come into the understanding of God's apostolic calling and gifting, I lacked the very ministry designed by Jesus himself to prepare me for true ministry. Now, we looked at verse 8. Let's move on to um, uh, Ephesians 4, 9. In saying he ascended, speaking of Christ, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? Now, we looked at this earlier in connection with Psalm 60, 18. I shared how I struggled with how the psalmist spoke of Jesus receiving gifts from men, even from the rebellious and um, Paul speaking of Jesus giving gifts to men. And simply put, Jesus fought to win back the dominion and authority from rebellious people and from the devil, who is the prince of pride and rebellion. And after Jesus redeemed our power and dominion, he gave the ascension gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher for the specific purpose outlined in both Psalm 68 and Ephesians 4. And I'm just going to point you out to two verses that, that support this. Ephesians 4.10, He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the, the heavens, that he might fill all things. Say, fill all things. He has this purpose. He wants to fill government and the schools, and the businesses, and the theaters, and the television, and the newscasting. He wants to fill all things with the presence of Christ through godly people. Amen. Psalm 68, 18. When you ascended on high, you took many cap captives. You received gifts from people, even from the rebellious. Why did he do that? that you, Lord God, might dwell there. Hear me in this. Psalm 68 speaks of Yah Elohim dwelling on the earth. Ephesians 4, 8 and 9 speaks of Jesus Messiah descending and ascending in order to fill all things. John 1, 14 says that, literally says that Jesus came to tabernacle or take up his tent among us. Isaiah 7, 14 and Matthew 1, 23 both refer to Jesus as Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
So before we put this together, let me set up the stage. I know what I was before Jesus tabernacled in me when I confessed him as Lord. My messed up life was straightened out. I became a new creature. You probably have a similar story. When Jesus does, or what Jesus does for individuals, he wants to do through you and me the same thing right where we work, shop, and play. Do you believe God wants this world to be a better place? Didn't he create humans to fill the earth and subdue it? But humans failed and Satan usurped their power and authority to fill the earth and subdue it. Then Jesus descended and ascended in order to give us the apostolic gifts to prepare the whole body of Christ to get the job done. He has no other plan. Isn't it time for us to step into the fullness of God's plan for us to rule and subdue the earth for his glory. A yes would be appropriate there. Number eight, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have a specific plan to fill the earth with apostolic people who will rule the earth for the glory of God. Consider this passage, which provides a key for everything else we'll study from this point on. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. And he, the ascended Christ, himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Number nine, for now, just consider the outcome. Consider God's desired outcome for his establishment of the apostolic fivefold government. The outcome is that the saints, all of them, are equipped. All God's people do the work of ministry. The body is edified. Believers come to unity of faith and knowledge. We all move toward Christian perfection and maturity. We move into Christ-likeness. Isn't this what you want? Isn't this what the world needs? Yes, indeed. And it's also God's plan for the church and for the world. Let's pray. Father, you have established an order, the order, that you want every local church and the church universal to operate in. You have called us in these last days the days that Paul and others said, the coming days that are now upon us. Prepare us in these last days to see that little sign that Pam threw at us, what's stopping you? What's keeping you from stepping into the fullness of God's plan and destiny for your life? Sure, he doesn't call every person to be a foreign missionary but he calls every person to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't call every person to be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher, but he sends us all. He calls us all to speak forth the word of God. He calls us all to reach out farther than we ever could before because of the power of Christ. He calls us all to guard and shepherd and care for one another. And he calls us all to teach what we have learned to others. So, Lord, today we call your church into apostolic fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to receive a blessing?
Lord Jesus, we exalt you and magnify you as Lord and King of the church. We thank you that you are standing in heaven making, ever making intercession for each person that's standing here this day. And that you have a call. Before you formed us in the womb, you knew us and chose us. So Lord, today we release the blessing that each one will step into the fullness of their destiny with a grace specific to the gifts that you have given them. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would put that little, little paper in front of us often. What's stopping you? And when we hear that voice, Lord, I release a blessing. We will operate in faith and take that step forward to complete the will of God. In Jesus' name, amen.